Hi everyone, this is Pastor Teresa at Beaver Ridge United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thanks for joining me on this Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and I hope that you are making plans to have a wonderful Thanksgiving in a couple of days. Here at Beaver Ridge, we will actually be serving a turkey or ham dinner to people from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., and uh, we would so look forward to meeting our community and um, celebrating Thanksgiving here at Beaver Ridge. It'll be a to-go box, and you'll come in and uh, mark the, on the menu what it is that you want and someone will get the meal prepared for you and give it to you for to, to, to take and to to go and enjoy with your family or friends so we're so excited about that and then on Sunday begins Advent here uh, for all Christians around the world um, our Christian calendar begins anew so it'll be like a, a new year for us as we enter into the season of Advent that's a time to prepare our hearts uh, the four weeks before um, Christmas. So lots of things going on over here at New Life. I, I mean, over here at Beaver Ridge. And I encourage you to um, check our website and to look and see what all and keep up with all the good stuff. Look at our outdoor sign. It'll have the next events on there. So thank you for joining me today. Let's dive in. We have been doing um, the, the stories in the Gospel of Mark. And so we are at um, the last part of 11, chapter 11, with the authority of Jesus question. Now, we are into Holy Week, and Jesus has been coming and going each day into Jerusalem and then and the evenings, walking the two miles back to Bethany to stay with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he has gone into Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? Things, they asked and who gave you authority to do this so they're beginning to question like what is going on you've come in here you have disrupted the flow of what they had control over in the way that they were controlling the temple activities and so forth and so they're confronting him this was entering into what they would call a debate and a part of the debate rules was that a person could debate by asking a question so the chief priests have asked the question. Now, to counter that, Jesus knew that he could ask them a question as part of the debate, and that's what he does. He replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Here's the question. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask them, Why, di why didn't you believe him? And, But if we say from men, they didn't even finish that sentence. They feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. And Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So, they're in a tough situation. And the thing is about the chief priests is that they were really good politicians too. And they understood this fine line between what they needed to do in order to maintain power. And they knew just how far they could go without uh, irritating or disrupting the people to the point where they might want change. So they realize that if they say that John ba John's baptism was uh, a gift from heaven or the authority was given to him by heaven, then why didn't they pay more attention to him, listen to him? Because what was John the Baptist's mission? It was to provide the way for the Messiah, to provide the way for Jesus, to point the way to Jesus. And he did fulfill that role. So if they say that his authority is by uh, given to him by God, then why didn't they pay more respect to him and listen to him? If they say it's by people, then that undermines uh, the the authority. It also undermines the fact that the people loved John the Baptist. He was out and among them, and he was somebody who wasn't afraid to go out into the wilderness and meet people right where they were. And so he was a beloved person in, in there, even though he was already deceased. He'd already been beheaded by um Herod at that time, he was still well-known, well-loved. And so chief priests recognized, we're not going to win this. So they bowed out of the conversation. 
Jesus wasn't through with them then. He goes on, and here we read the rest of the story in chapter 12. He then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. Now, this is how they ran vineyards back then. Someone would own the land, and then they would hire the tenants to come in and take care of the land. All that Jesus had just said in this parable was how things were practiced. So they're like, yeah, 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 that's just how, how it's done here. Um, he rented the vineyard. He went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. They, he still sent another, and they killed that one. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send. It was a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out into the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? Jesus asked. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyards to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they weren't afraid of the crowd. But they were, sorry, they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. So Jesus starts this parable and everything seems to be just as what you would think in their own society or culture for that day. What often happened is that then the landowner would come and he would want his portion of the produce that they had harvested, in this case a vineyard, so it was grapes. And they would want that, the owner would want his portion. It was 50-50 uh, or it was 60-40 or you know, whatever they had agreed upon. But somehow in this process, the ones who had rented the land, the servants, the workers, they had become, they had uh, stepped over their boundaries and, and were acting like they were actually the ones who owned it, that they were taking authority that they did not have. And the Pharisees and the, I mean, the chief priests recognized themselves in this parable. You know, God has ownership of everything. We're called to be good stewards of it. So God is owner of all. We're called to be the hands and feet to work the vineyard, to bring God's kingdom into place. That's how God has chosen for it to work through you and me. And so here is a reflection of when the king wants what is his, when God is wanting what is his, what Jesus was saying in this parable was, you chief priests, you have taken ownership. You act as though you're actually God and you've done everything. And when God sent uh, prophets and um, other people to come and, and to share the message of who God is, they rejected it time and time again, uh, beating those prophets up, uh, shaming them um, into the point of death. And so, God sends his son, right? So he sent Jesus. They had a moment because they had some sort of awareness that this parable was about them. So they had a moment where they could have repented and said, you know, this is about us. And we have taken the temple. We've taken the Lord's house. We've taken his people and we've claimed it as ours. And we are, we are acting in place of God. And God just needed them to repent, to change. And they weren't going to do that. Instead, they recognize themselves and they decide to leave and what are they doing? They're now talking about how they're going to kill Jesus. So even though they see that this parable is about them, they're too far into this that they're not able to stop or don't or choose not to stop. And Jesus says and reminds them of scripture that comes from Psalm 118, 22 and 23. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. In other words, the stone that you have rejected, Jesus God will take that capstone or that stone and make it the capstone of the new temple, the church. How powerful is that? The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
So Jesus is pulling it from old scripture in order to remind them of the prophecy and that the prophecy is being fulfilled right then and there. You are going to reject the stone and God will take that rejection and he will build a new church, a new temple. And they will be his people and he will be their God. They don't react the way they should. And so they, but yet they were afraid of the crowd too and what might happen. So they've had to leave Jesus, pull away from them and then look for a way to arrest him and to have him crucified. This is just a reminder for us today to never be so caught up in the things that we have control over, the things that God has blessed us with in stewardship to be his hands and feet, to bring his love and heart into this world that we, we remain mindful of who we are that this is all God's and we are are to be good stewards and in that we give God what is God's and we get to be a part of his story and a part of the of the blessing as God tells his story as it continues to unfold so the chief priests chose on that day they were not going to be a part of God's story but we have a choice today too and we choose to be a part of God's story. So as you go about this day, look for ways to be thankful. God, thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for my church. Thank you for all the things that you have blessed me with. And help me to be the good steward that, that I need to be in order to not take charge and twist things, but to act out in love and continue to be a co-laborer with God in this world. It is a blessing. And I hope that you are blessed this day. And I hope that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And if you want to come down and see me and all the others down here, come between 11 and 1 on Thursday and let's have a Thanksgiving meal and continue the blessing. Father God, bless us each and every one to continue to do the service you called us to. Give us the strength and the endurance and the patience and the love to continue to be your hands and feet. Thank you, God, for this day. In your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You all be blessed and we will see each other soon.